Eight Mysteries of the Brain. Number eight, sleeping and dreaming. Humans spend about a third of their lives sleeping, but we aren't exactly sure why we sleep. Almost every single animal sleeps, which is odd when you think about it. Sleep must be really important if almost every species on the planet shares its need and evolution hasn't found a way around it. When we sleep, our conscious awareness has been switched off for the most part and leaves us completely unaware of things going on around us, rendering us entirely vulnerable. But if we are deprived of sleep, we eventually die. So why do we sleep? It could be so that our brains can recharge and our bodies can rejuvenate their energy. It could also be so that we can store away important memories and dump the useless information. There is a belief that sleeping aids in encoding our long-term memories. Giulio Tononi argued that sleep was how we return our brain cells to a baseline state. As for dreaming, scientists are still unsure of their purpose. They could simply be a random neural impulse or perhaps a way of coping with real-world problems. Maybe it's our brain's way of processing painful emotions so we can cope when we are awake. This video, we wanted to acknowledge one of our favorite longtime viewers, Jim Spencer. We love to hear encouraging comments from our viewers, like this one. Every video you make is better than the last one. Keep up the good work. We try to make all of our videos better for our subscribers every week. So if you guys have any suggestions, please post them for us below. Seven, conscious awareness. Undoubtedly, conscious awareness is one of the most amazing and mystifying aspects of the human brain. It is what makes us unique and gives us the ability to self-reflect. Consciousness is what allows humans to experience and engage in their environment in an apparently self-directed way. We aren't zombies. We can have our own thoughts, preferences, opinions, and feelings. These traits allow us to each figure out the world and how we will operate within it. Despite it being such a huge part of who we are, neuroscientists still have no idea how these incoming sensations get sent through the brain in such a way that they are translated into subjective experiences like color, taste, and pain, or how we can create a mental picture in our minds at the drop of a hat. Scientists believe that it may have something to do with the way in which the sensory parts of our brains are linked to midbrain structures. Some believe that consciousness is a bundle of semi-independent agencies or a society of the mind. Consciousness could also be used to describe the dozens of various processes happening in the brain at any given moment. But in the end, no one really has a clue. 6. Cognitive Computation Alan Turing, a computer scientist, started this debate by arguing that any real-world computation, including cognition, has the ability to be translated into an equivalent computation using the Turing machine. This gave rise to the functionality model of human cognition. The theory states that organic minds are in their simplest form a classical information processor. There are a few scientists like Miguel Nicolalis who argue that the brain is not computable and that no amount of engineering could recreate it. He states that human consciousness can't be imitated in silicon due to its most important features being the result of nonlinear, unpredictable interactions between billions of brain cells. Indeed, the brain may be driven by certain analog functions which require a physical basis. However, perhaps consciousness and cognition are based in an alternative computational form that hasn't been discovered yet. It is very clear that certain parts of cognition are computational in nature, such as our mathematical abilities. But which ones are and which ones aren't? I guess we will have to wait and see if someone finds out. Number 5. Nature versus Nurture the nature versus nurture debate has been going on for many years and it's quite a conundrum to solve. Some scientists argue that we are born with predisposed genetic traits that influence our psychology. However, other scientists believe in the blank slate hypothesis, which suggests that there are no innate traits present in the mind at birth and that all of our personal preferences, characteristics, and personality traits are constructed through social interactions. 
Many studies on twins separated at birth have been conducted, but they only help somewhat. It is hard to tell when the effects of genes start and end, particularly as they are either suppressed or reinforced through social experiences. Once you throw epigenetics into the mix where you have to consider which genetic expression is either activated or paused due to environmental circumstances, things get really complicated. Although we may never truly know the answer to the nature versus nurture question, it may in fact be moot due to our brains constantly changing based on the environments around us. Impressive! Or free will. Philosophers have been having the free will debate for hundreds of years, but scientists have only recently decided to involve themselves in this topic, and they may not like what they are seeing. The debate has led to a few different theories. The first is cosmological determinism, where everything continues through time in a predictable way. Second is indeterminism, which is the concept that our actions within the universe are completely random. Thirdly, compatibilism, or cosmological libertarianism, which states that free will is logically compatible with our universe. Experiments have shown that our unconscious mind has the ability to initiate seemingly voluntary acts, sometimes even earlier than our conscious mind. In the 1980s, Benjamin Leibet found that we don't have free will over the initiation of our movements, but we can stop the movement at the last moment. In other words, we can't start the movement, but we can stop it. It seems like free will to me, but scientists still can't explain whether or not we truly have free will. Number 3. Storing and Accessing Memories Much like a computer's hard drive, our memories are physically written in our brains, but we have no clue how our brains do it or how the information gets orientated in the brain. Even more impressive is that we don't only have one type of memory. We have long-term and short-term memory, and we also have declarative memory, which helps us remember names and facts, and non-declarative memory, which is more commonly called muscle memory. Within our long-term memories, we also have flashbulb memories, which are like little pictures in our brains, where we can remember exact details from momentous events. And if that wasn't enough, different parents of our brain have different memory abilities, so it is quite a complex process. Neuroscientists believe that the storage of a memory is dependent on the connection between synapses and associations. In other words, memories aren't discrete bits of data, but are a relation between two or more things, such as falling off the bed causing pain or a hug causing happiness. Scientists are still unsure about how memories form or why certain memories fade or degrade, why sometimes a false memory is formed, and why we sometimes can't access a memory that we know is there. It is a fairly imperfect yet impressive process. Number 2. Movement and Reaction As a baby, you learn to roll over and crawl. As a toddler, you learn to walk and eventually run. As an older child, teenager and adult, we have flexibility, dexterity and control, all of which allows us to move our bodies however we want to. But the mystery is how we move so controllably. Think of how much dexterity and control you need to thread a needle or play a concerto. When you consider how unpredictable and haphazard our motor nerve impulses really are, you can see how those simple feats are actually really impressive. There must be something really high-tech going on between our cerebral cortex and our motor cortex that allows us to have such smooth and efficient movements. But you also need to consider timing. Every single human being has an internal clock which is yet another mystery of the brain, and these clocks do an amazing job of relaying our surroundings to us in real time, even though there is a delay in cognition. Our brains take one-tenth of a second to process what we see, so if a car passes you at 120 miles per hour, it will have traveled 15 feet before our brains become aware of it. A recent study has shown that our brains push moving objects forward so that we perceive them as being further ahead in space and time than they really are. This means that our brains are not in sync with the world around us. That's kind of strange, isn't it? What do you think about some of these mysteries? Why do we dream? Do we really have free will? Discuss in the comments below and your comment could be featured in one of our future videos. Number 1. Perception 
The main purpose of the brain is to convert our senses into experiences. Our perceptions allow us to identify, interpret, and organize sensory information in a way that allows us to understand the world around us. But how does the brain transfer this incoming sensory data into vivid experiences? And how are these perceptions arranged in the brain? This is a problem that is related to our complicated consciousness and the onset of qualia which is the subjective feeling that we all get after tasting chocolate or seeing a certain color. Neuroscientists believe that the nervous system is the focus point of the human perception. Our different organs take in different stimuli, such as smell or sound, and we somehow convert it into something we call perception. Perception is also controlled by various parts of the brain. There have been many studies conducted in an attempt to understand perception including optical illusions, but scientists have yet to discover just how the brain makes sense of the inputs. As you can see, the human brain is still a complete mystery. So what's going to happen when we try to replicate that in a machine? Find out in our video 10 weird and terrifying stories about artificial intelligence. See you all there. The world's first robot citizen isn't even a real AI. This is Sophia the robot, and that face looks more like a secretly crazy ant than anything else. This is a photo from June this year, when it gave a speech at the AI for Good Global Summit in Geneva. Sophia is the very first machine in history.